how can we sustain observing the observer <laughs> in our meditation? <clears throat> For me, I experience it only fleetingly. Thank you. Yeah, observing the observer. Um, well, I, I know <clears throat> observing the observer isn't kind of that important in the beginning. It's more that you are this, you kind of, you kind of are this observer. And then you observe what's going on in your mind. If you want to, you can also try to look, <laughs> to kind of observe you as the observer. But it, 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 uh, the, the, um, the main point here is that you put all your mental kind of energy in just being here and just observing what's going on in your mind and trying not to put all your mental energy into all kind of thoughts and fantasies and emotions which are like unwholesome emotions arising in you. Just being here, just being present moment, be an observer, have awareness, be mindful of what's going on in your head. That's the that's main thing about this observer. But it, maybe, maybe it can be kind of fun to kind of observe that you are an observer, <laughs> but it, it, that doesn't have that much kind of function as far as I can see. Uh, and, and, that, it, and that experience is fleeting. Yeah, I, I kind of understand that. <laughs> but try just be aware of what's going on. Just be the, the be this, uh, um, just be this this person who are here, who are present, who are aware, who are mindful of our body and our mind and our surroundings. Just observe and try to develop wholesome states and peace. Hmm. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> what is time? <laughs> um, well, the only important time is right now. And the rest of time seems to be very um, malleable, seems to be very uh, subjective. Of course, we have to use conventions to live in the world, so I guess time developed through seeing day and night and dividing it up into hours and seconds, minutes and seconds, and then also perhaps seasons as well. But um, it's very interesting that some of you already mentioned time's going too fast. And when you're having a difficult meditation, time's going far too slowly. But even between this realm and in Buddhist cosmology, we understand that there are other realms, for example, the Deva realms. And in those realms, people live for eons, or let's say Devas live for eons. So there's this little story about uh, what happened in the human realm that... Uh, husband and wife, or it could be a husband and husband, or a wife and a wife, whoever they were, um, one of them died first. They were very attached to each other, and one of them sadly passed away first. And uh, the other one went up to the Deva realm. And shortly after that, or maybe actually quite a long time after that, maybe 20 years, I'm making this up, the other partner died in the human realm. And they got to the Deva realm too, and met their now Deva partner, and the Deva partner said, where have you been the last hour? <laughs> so <laughs> for them, that was only an hour. For us, it was like 20 years. So it's said that the Devas can live for like thousands and thousands of years. I think like between 20,000 and 100,000 or something like this. So time is uh, very subjective. And uh, yeah, the only really important time is now. And the only time you can actually do anything about the past or the future is now, and it depends on how you look at it. You know, whether you look at it through eyes of loving kindness, through um, positivity, through um, a sense of patience, or um, what else is good? Gratitude, or whether you look at everything through kind of fault-finding eyes, and then time goes really slow. Yeah. Even in English, we say, "No, time flies when you're having fun." So. But the main thing is to make use of the time. And the only time you can make use of really is now and how you relate to that moment. Luckily, I didn't get that question. <laughs> um, is it okay to use 
words like breathing in, breathing out, uh, just this to help settle into sitting. Or it is just using the mind too much. Thanks. Yeah, okay. So basically, the idea, the, the suggestion here is that when you meditate, you can add some words to your physical breathing. So you sit there and you're breathing in, and then you say that. Like you, it's like an inter, in, internal commentary, like breathing in, breathing out. And then you just think the thoughts. So it becomes like a mantra. And that is okay to do, uh, if you want to, and if it's helpful. Because this, this is one of the things I, I had to learn when I was a younger monastic. When I, I started an extremely kind of active mind. <laughs> and I learned that the uh, meditation on breathing was too um, subtle for me. I couldn't kind of keep my focus on the breath. It wasn't enough inspiring or entertaining. So what I, what I did, I started to kind of make that meditation object bigger. So one of the suggestions I got was to add counting. So you breathe in, one, out, two, etc. And then I started to add visualizations. So I, I made this, I'm like a visual person, that's my personality. I'm very kind of uh, eye focused, not so much ear and hearing. So for me, it was like, I, I just made a little scenery in my mind with something just moving in parallel to my breath. So then I had like a little, a tiny little movie I can look at. And I could also <laughs> include a little bit of kind of mental activity in parallel to the breath. So in that way I made this, this breath like a much bigger thing. So then in the beginning, when my mind was very kind of coarse and quick and I don't know, full of emotions, it was easier to focus on the breath. But then, as I got kind of deeper and deeper into the breath, and my mind calmed down, I threw them out again. So then the first thing I threw out was the visualizations. Then I was only breathe, following the breathing, and I was counting. And then when I, when I became even more settled, I threw out counting. Because then my mind was subtle enough, peaceful enough, just to be able to focus on the breath. And then, when you go even deeper, you can you let go of the breath as well. So it's like I made like make a big deal out of it, and then threw it out as my mind calmed down. And what this person here is doing is a little bit of the same. You add something verbally to the breath, which is okay. And then later on, if you get into deeper stage, you just throw it out and just focus on the breath. So that's one option, like one skillful means you can you can use. <coughs> so, uh, 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 is it too much? Yes, it's too much later on, in deeper states, it's, it's too much. I mean, but in the beginning, it's not. It's absolutely fine. How do you deal with praise and blame? <laughs> Yeah, um, I think before I came into a leadership role, I didn't deal with it too well. Not as well, but once you become in the public eye, you're going to get tons of praise and blame, and it becomes very obvious that it's nothing to do with you. It really does, because it goes to extremes. You know, some people say, <laughs> you've saved my life, you're the most compassionate person I've ever met. I go, okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm quite kind, you know, I try my best in life. And then other people say, oh, you've, you know, completely ruined, well, not ruined my life, I don't think I've heard that, but, you know, if you fall from that pedestal, you really crash, you know. And I've learned to not trust either. <laughs> and a really nice example of how I started to learn not to trust these things, because I think I was always somebody... I guess generally, and maybe a lot of women are this way, or people socialise as women, that we are praised for how much we do for others and how much we give to others and being a good little girl and all of this. So I used to try very hard to be please, pleasing and agreeable to everybody. And, you know, this was partly because I genuinely wanted to. I wanted to be kind. I wanted to be, you know, well-behaved and all the rest. 
But then I noticed as a teenager when I wasn't able to be that good little girl, suddenly I wasn't loved in the same way. So that was really a shock. And I guess at that time I sort of rebelled. But still that habit continued, you know, of kind of obviously preferring praise and kind of trying to shy away from blame, trying to uh, avoid it happening in the first place, right? And then one nice little story that happened at Bodhinyana Monastery when I was there for the Rains Retreat around about 2012 or 13 was that uh, I was judging someone else for asking so many questions in every single sutta class. And this sutta class was, uh, you know, for the monastics mainly, and this person was a lay person. And Ajahn Brahm actually had to make a rule just for this person to say only three questions. <laughs> you probably know who it is. And anyway, <laughs> they find a way around it. They'd say, I'm just asking a question on this person's behalf. It's not my question, it's their question. <laughs> because they didn't finish their question. So I'm asking that question. But it wouldn't be a question, it would be a dialogue with Ajahn Brahm. So this would take up quite a lot of time. And I found myself thinking, that's quite selfish, you know. They shouldn't be taking so much time. And then guess what? I got my lesson because the next day he did the Ratana Sutta, which is one of my favourite suttas. And I got so engrossed that I definitely exceeded my three questions. And I realised at some point that I was kind of taking up quite a lot of time. And suddenly I felt a lot of shame. And I went to Ajahn Brahm at the end. I said, I'm really sorry. I just uh, took too much time and asked too many questions. Maybe other people didn't get a chance. And he just looked at me and said, no, you're just interested because he always sees the best. But that didn't satisfy me, because I wanted to beat myself up, you know. I really wanted to, like, beat myself. I deserve this. So I asked another person, you know, sorry about that. Like, I took too much time, I asked a lot of questions, and that's, you know, that other person always does that, and I criticised them. They said, good that you know it. <laughs> they, they stormed off. I oh, no! <laughs> so then I felt like the next morning I went to the kitchen where all the Anagarikas were, and I had to go around and tell them, well, I'm really sorry about this. And the next one said, oh, did you ask too many questions? I didn't notice. <laughs> really? So then I thought, this is really interesting. And I asked the next person, and they said, your questions were so deep, totally different from that other person's questions. <laughs> they're shiny. They're shiny. Uh, <laughs> so thank you very much for your questions. Now I want to go and live in a monastery. And they actually did go and live in a monastery for the next 10 years or so. And, uh, yeah, the next person also said, yeah, thanks for your questions or whatever. And I realised that nobody, basically everybody has a completely different perception. And it's entirely unique to them and it's nothing to do with me. Nothing to do with my perception because I had a different perception as well. So after that it really weakened my, um, the amount of value that I give to other people's perceptions. And that's been very helpful in my role now. Because really, when you're in the public eye, people project, basically, I think most people relate to us purely through projection, by what it is we mean to them. And I guess this is happening throughout our lives, to some extent, but especially when you're in a kind of spiritual leadership role, then people want you to be something. And I try to kind of goof around quite a lot to try and <laughs> diminish that possibility, you know, of putting me on a pedestal. But still, yeah, I realise that basically praise and blame are usually more to do with the person who's attributing that praise and blame than it is to do with us. So that's one way that I handle it. And um, yeah, and also I do Ajahn Brahm's method of uh, keeping the praise. And actually it's lovely that in our role we do get probably more praise and the things that are a bit negative, you just think, yeah, this person's having a hard time. Don't take it personally, you know, have some compassion for them. And, you know, if there's something in it that's helpful, if there's some feedback in there that could be useful, great. But if you know it's only about them and their difficult time, then just develop compassion and let it go. So that's the way I kind of am learning to deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> in the West, they teach, if you want to be mindful, start to meditate. Is there another way around? No. Um, Start by being mindful. Practice mindfulness in your everyday life. Then your meditation will be better. Yeah, maybe they do teach that in the West. Like a lot of uh, places in, like in Europe and North America. 
and you, if you want to, if you want to be mindful, start meditating. Which is also true. If you do a lot of med- uh, meditation, you calm down your mind, so it's much easier to be aware of what's going on in your mind. So it's so, so yes. Um, but is there another way around? Start by being mindful. Practice mindfulness in your everyday life. That is also true. Uh, then your meditation will be better. That is also true. <laughs> Very good. Win, win, win. Win. All good. I totally agree. <laughs> Ooh, how do you define mind? When you have a clear and happy mind, is that also awareness? Hmm. The Buddha didn't really differentiate, I don't think, between mind and awareness. What he did differentiate between were the six different senses that we have, six different sense consciousnesses. And I'm going to talk a bit about this tomorrow, but we basically have a... Eye consciousness, seeing, if you like. Uh, Ear consciousness, hearing. Nose consciousness, smelling, tasting, touching. And knowing with the mind. So the knowing, to my understanding, is the mind. uh, Vijnana. And uh, mind consciousness is like every other phenomenon. It's impermanent. So, And there is also mindfulness that can be aware of that. So it's a little bit um, confusing, and I think it's probably better not to get into kind of the meta- metaphysical ideas around this. It's a little bit similar to the last question about, like, can you know the knowing? And Ajahn Brahm always says that's a bit of a delusion to feel that there's, like, something knowing the knowing. Because what's actually happening is the mind consciousness is changing so fast that you know that you knew. You don't know that you know that you know, <laughs> right? And this is how a lot of philosophies happen, that you know that you know. In other words, there's something inside that's kind of transcendent, um, that's aware that it knows. And this is where kind of all kinds of eternalism theories come about. But actually the mind consciousness is changing at kind of very high velocity, very high speed. So you only can know that you knew. So even if the eye sees something, the mind then knows that the eye sees something. It's not that the mind knows that, you, that the mind is seeing something. It knows that the eye or that the seeing just happened. And it happens so fast that it's hard to separate the mind from the other consciousnesses. The mind consciousness from the other consciousnesses. But what we're trying to do in um, meditation, especially samatha meditation, is to free the mind as far as possible and perhaps completely from the five senses. So you've already started to notice, many of you, that the body's starting to fade sometimes. Maybe you notice that um, you're not really hearing anything. Maybe the bell rang and you weren't even aware or it was just a very distant sound. And... um, even the images and the impressions of those senses start to fade from the mind. So you're starting to be able to see the mind without interference from the other senses. And that mind does become clear and happy because it gets all the energy before the energy was kind of going into all these other areas. But now it's just filling up your mind, if you like. Um, So, yeah, the, the mindfulness, the awareness will be very, very strong at that point, because the mind is kind of empowered. So, I don't know if that makes sense, but I think um, that's probably more helpful than differentiating between mind and awareness. The, the mind is aware, right? I mean, one of the things that's, um, that Ajahn Brahm also argues against some of these wrong views that happen is that some people say, well, the mind exists after Parinibbana, right? So after everything ceases, including consciousness, there's still some kind of original mind But if there is and there's no consciousness, then that mind is unconscious. (laughs) So what's the point of such a mind, right? Does that make sense? It's a little bit deep, but... (laughs) Basically, the function of the mind is to be conscious. Yeah. Oh, has your own practice changed after you started teaching? Uh, P.S. Is that a bear or some kind of monkey sitting next to Ajahn Nito? Uh, 
<laughs> yes, let's let's uh, let's have like. A, can anybody tell me what it is? <laughs> looks up. No, don't read it. It kind of looks a bit about this uh, this character in one of this. Oh, It's one of the characters in this Norwegian movie, um, kind of really old animation movie called Flokripa. And this name, the guy Ludwig. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's Ludwig. <laughs> So it's me and Ludwig sitting here. <laughs> and Ludwig was so kind. He was a bit kind of, kind of shy, maybe. A bit simple, but really kind. <laughs> but early uh, question. <clears throat> um, has your own practice changed after you started teaching? Um, uh, yes, in a bad way. <laughs> 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 because I don't have so much time for my own practice. So I, I had a lot of, uh, I basically got like 14 years in Australia just for myself. I hardly did anything. So I could just practice and, and really get, kind of speed up my own development. But then I left Australia, I came here, and since then I've just been working a lot. So since I started to teach and building this organization, I have like a temporary like a slowing down of my own uh, kind of uh, development. But I do have a three months retreat every year. Then I'm completely alone up in the mountains and that's absolutely lovely. And it is also the case that <clears throat> um, uh, when you suddenly are there out in the, in the public and you have to start traveling around and teaching, <laughs> you come into situations which you don't come into when you are like a young monastic in some kind of monastery somewhere because there you're very protected and that means that you're also protected from the defilements which can arise in you so when you then have to go out in the world and meet a lot of people then it's much it's it's clearer for me to see defilements they're not triggered in a protected environment a little bit like being here now for you you're not working, you're not with your family, <clears throat> so there's much less activity which can trigger uh, your defilements, which create negative mental states. And that's what I did for many, many, many years. And then I came here, and I started to work, and I was tired, and, and, and did my really best, and it's going really well. But then I'm exposed to so much activity, and then it's, it's, some, it's, it's kind of, it, it shows me where I have work to do. So it gets, it gets clearer uh, where I have a job to do. So in that sense, um, it, it has changed. My whole life has changed and I'm kind of adjusting to a new, a new type of lifestyle. But I will, like, like other seniors, when, when we find a place and we can buy a place, I can kind of get into a routine, a, a lifestyle, which is a little bit better than what I have now. And then I can be a little bit more of a monastic and have a bit more like settled kind of surrounding for myself. Now I'm just <laughs> floating around uh, uh, without any like, like base, which uh, gives me some freedom, but also I, I lack this this uh, what Brahmachand now just have got, and I will get three weeks ago <laughs> <laughs> after eight years yeah. plus. Yeah. 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 Then you have the uh, renovations, too. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so stupid that I want to build a retreat center. <laughs> um, so that's how it has changed. Not more work less practice temporarily but I'm learning a lot and it is part of this monastic path to teach and to learn to combine this thing that you continue your own development and you help and serve others so that's me <laughs> okay <laughs> you have to be careful what you say because you get questioned on it the next day <gasps> Okay. You briefly mentioned Ajahn Brahm's comment that the practice on non-self takes us further than that on impermanence. Can you elaborate? Thank you. Thank you for asking, because it's important to the, not mistake what Ajahn Brahm, uh, what I might have said about Ajahn Brahm and what he really meant. 
So um, I was actually talking about non-self as an easier route into deep meditation. That doesn't mean it takes us further. It just means that the perception of impermanence um, is best left till later. Um, the perception of impermanence, I think, actually goes deeper because non-self, seeing through the illusion of a self, let's say, is what happens at stream winning. So that's the first breakthrough to right view. Yeah. But at that point, you've still not fully, fully, fully... I mean, you have seen impermanence to the end, but you've not experienced complete ending of things, complete cessation. If you like, that only really happens after Parinibbana. So, of course, impermanence and the, an understanding of an impermanence and some experience and direct experience of it is also very helpful, especially for overcoming some of the hindrances, some of the defilements of the mind... Um, for me, incredibly helpful in becoming a lot more economous and far less craving and aversion. I mean, the hindrances could be gone for days, weeks, months when I was focused on impermanence as a perception. Um, but still, the object was changing. So it wasn't going to develop into something more conceptual that can be used to take you into jhana because we were observing something, uh, hmm, how to say, it's not exactly the deepest reality, but it's not a concept. So when the breath turns into a nimitta, that's a kind of perception. It's not a real thing. It's a mental um, image of the breath. It's a concept. It's not real, if you like. Um, whereas the perception of impermanence is something a bit different to that. So, um, yeah, hopefully that's enough to clarify. But, I mean, what I understood by that in the talk that I was referring to was that uh, the practice perceiving things through a lens of non-self, because we don't see it fully before we're stream winners, um, is actually very helpful to get into deep meditation because it helps the doer get out of the way. You know, it helps us stop interfering and just sit back and be the passenger. It helps us focus more on putting causes in place instead of kind of seeking to make things happen. So whenever that sense of self crops up, uh, it interferes. So that's uh, a really, really helpful perception, both for jhana meditation and also um, leading towards the first breakthrough of stream winning, when we see through this illusion of a self. Yeah. Can you just explain in impermanence what that means? Yeah, I mean, there's different translations of this thing called anicca. Sometimes it means impermanence, that nothing's uh, lasting, everything basically arises and passes away. But it can also mean like instability, um, irregularity, something that's not reliable, inherently not reliable. And actually, they're all aspects of the same. Like, things are cannot be said to be a self in the sense of eternal precisely because they are changing. And things cannot be said to be happiness because things that change basically are suffering by their very nature. So the three go together. They always go together. They're aspects of the same, but you can focus slightly differently on one, say, prioritize one over another in the practice. Does that make sense? Yeah. When I think about the stage where you are repelled by the world because you really see everything as Dukkha and Icha, I felt a bit worried or a kind of small fear. Any advice, please? Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you are repelled by the world. <clears throat> okay, this is part of this Buddhist training that you... you um, um, you're basically starting to understand what you said about An Anicca Dukkha Anatta, uh, about our existence. And what happens then is that you get this, um, the, Buddha, the word the Buddha was using was Nibida. But that is not ill will. Okay? It's, it's not a defiled kind of negativity. So when we write here, you are repelled by the world, the words here kind of signify some negativity. But this this uh, this idea of what what is the translation they normally use in the text? Um, it used to be disenchantment, 
Yeah. But then that changed to kind of repulsion and revulsion. I think Bhikkhu Bodhi actually uses revulsion there. But being repelled from, it's not being repelled by right. the world, it's being repelled from it, which is different. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it? Because it's like you're moving off. It, it is basically that through a training, you get another world, a view of this life and this world we're doing. And you basically find something which is so much better. You kind of, you're aiming for Nibbana or some kind of higher type of existence. And, uh, she was talking about some Deva world or some Brahma world or something. And then you, you, get, this, you get this kind of lack of interest. More and more you kind of, you kind of pull away from, for example, first pulling away from being a, a, a human being because you're attracted to something better. And then you maybe you kind of pull away from that and you, you, you kind of gravitating to something which is the highest. And then you get, I don't know, repelled or you have this disinterest or you just, uh, uh, you don't find that all this satisfaction again, uh, so much satisfaction in this normal life we have. And that is a consequence of this training we do. And that is what leads us to um, uh, uh, awakening. And one, one easy thing is that if you get into very deep meditation, and we talked a little bit about jhana this morning, and, and this state of jhana, deep meditation, is extremely uh, uplifting or fantastic. It's, it's a kind of a level of freedom and energy and bliss which basically you have to experience to kind of get a grasp on because work doesn't go there. So it's a little bit that you, have, you, get some, you get an insight into something, an experience onto something which is so much better. And then suddenly it isn't all that fun anymore to do all this worldly stuff we're doing. So we get this pull towards something better coming from our own experience and developing wisdom. That's what, that is what's happening. Um, so I felt a bit worried and kind of small fear. You will not be afraid. You will, it's just an absolutely natural process. You just learn something new. You get some really fantastic experiences. And you just, because of those experiences, you kind of, your lifestyle kind of changes. Absolutely natural. You don't need to think about it. You say, okay. So there's no, in, in this idea here of this nibida, it's not kind of negativity. It's not kind of like you dislike or you kind of hate. Or, or you negative to to kind of this world. It's just that you found something better, and uh, there's an, and you will not be afraid because you know where you're going. Okay, no reason to be afraid. Absolutely natural. The only thing you're doing is going towards something which is better and better and better and better. <laughs> That's really easy. Okay, maybe I'll do another one too. What is the meaning and uh, differences between Bante, Aya, Ajahn, Venerable? Nothing. How do you prefer to be addressed? Thank you. Um, the only difference between those is the Ajahn. Uh, Bante, Aya and Venerable are all the same. Venerable is the translation of Bante and Aya. Bante is usually used for men, Aya is usually used for women, but not always. Um, in fact, I think both of them are quite gender neutral, so you could apply them to either of us. Sometimes people call me Bante. I call the monks Aya when I ordained. We say, Aya, Aya, please give me the ordination, Ayas. So um, they basically mean venerable, but venerable is used in Perth, um, in our communities there, the Bhikkhu and the Bhikkhuni Sangha, uh, by all monks and nuns. So I really like that because it's a dem democratic and gender neutral. So everybody's venerable, whether you're a novice, whether you're a fully ordained, whether you're a monk or a non, you're all venerable. 
So, and that's lovely because we use it between each other too most of the time. Like even my friend Venerable Upeka, I mean, I call her Venerable um, because it reminds me that what she's done is worthy of veneration. The renunciation is worthy of veneration. And Ajahn is a sort of, I think, a title. I think most bikinis choose not to go with it because, I mean, it's fine to go with it, especially as a monk, it's quite natural because after 10 reigns in the Thai forest tradition, people are called Ajahn. It just means teacher. And it's something that symbolizes that you've done 10 reigns, 10 years in the robes. Uh, for bikinis, we tend not to use it because we don't um, feel part of the Thai forest tradition. It's a Thai word. And uh, we've been rejected, which we don't mind. <laughs> it's like nibida, not negativity. Well, <laughs> not from my part anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, so bikini ordination hasn't been um, embraced by most of the Thai forest tradition. So, yeah, we just don't really take that word. And also, to me, it seems a bit like a kind of title. And I don't mean that people use it because of that, but I guess I just like to not use it. Um, some bikinis use it, and some monks don't. Bhante Sajato, Bhikkhu Bodhi, they don't use Ajahn. So it's up to us, really, I guess. And it's what we've been called by our, uh, by our companions and teachers. Yeah. I think Ajahn Brahm was the first one to call me venerable when I was still a, a Burmese nun. And I was like, really? And he said, yes, yes, you're venerable. I thought, oh, that's really nice. So he kind of gave me that name. Yeah. So that was nice. Can I do another one? Yes, please. I want some meditation questions. What have I asked for? Let's see. What can you say about, <laughs> here we go, spontaneous jhana-like experiences? Ooh. Like those experienced by Ramana Maharshi and Eckhart Tolle. <laughs> well, I can't say anything about their experiences because I have no idea what they experienced at all. Uh, it's really difficult to say whether they really had... Yeah, Jana like okay, perhaps. Um, I think... People who maybe have these one-off experiences almost by chance, certainly in the case of Eckhart Tolle, as far as I know, because I don't read their books, you know. Um, it could be some past life thing, that they practiced these things before. It could be just a kind of fluke that in a moment some letting go happens. I think it's unlikely it's an actual jhana. I think it's more likely it's a nimitta, where maybe they're free from the five senses and they experience a lot of bliss because nimittas as well, if they're stable especially, can be incredibly blissful. Like blow your mind kind of bliss. Even pre-nimitta can be really mind-blowingly blissful. And you can really feel like you've experienced something beyond because you're getting a kind of sense of what it's like in the Brahma Loka, in the realm of the gods, if you like. So... And I think the difference with both of these people experiencing those things is that because they don't have um, probably the Buddha's teachings in their mind, in other words, there's probably not the right view into the pervasive nature of suffering, that that pervades basically everything, then they are likely to take these experiences as a kind of union with God and even liberation, because in the Hindu tradition, Samadhi, or uh, what they call um, jnana, jnana, I think. There's jnana for wisdom, but there's also jhana. Um, oh, it's dhyana, isn't it? It's D-H-Y-A-N-A. -A. That is the culmination of samadhi. That is the aim of yoga, basically. Sorry, I meant of yoga. So um, in Patanjali's Yoga Siddhas, which I studied while I did my Indian medicine degree, um, and also I spent many years doing yoga in India, um, we learned the, diff the actual eight limbs of yoga, not kind of what they make up these days, but the actual eight limbs. And some of those are like uh, yama and niyama, like what you should and shouldn't do. So basically ethics. And then uh, asana is one of them, which is actually your postures. But And then this kind of proceeds towards what they call dhyana, which is like a jhana. But again, because that's considered liberation, mokka, moksha in Sanskrit, um, I think those practitioners stop there and they feel that that's it, they're free. The problem being that you're only free when you're in those states. That's when the five hindrances of uh, 
disappeared and they could disappear for a long time. And if somebody like Ramana Maharshi probably was experiencing those maybe often, I don't know. And if you experience them often, it can be the case that you don't experience the hindrances for days, weeks, months, maybe even years, and you actually think you're enlightened. So I think that's the main difference there. Um, spontaneous jhana-like experiences probably happen either by lock, because you've uh, reached a point where you just can't keep holding on, or because of some past practice. But I don't know how useful they are without right view. That's my feeling. And also without some skill in um, being able to repeat the experiences. And that's what I think um, many monastics are practicing with, many you know, people are practicing with that, you know, making these stable um, and using them to gain deeper and deeper insight into the truth of things, whatever that might be, informed by the Buddha's teaching. Does mindfulness have a refresh rate <laughs> for you, where you, uh, where you return to sensations x times per second? For me, it seems like ten times per second. Okay, or uh, refresh. Okay, refresh rate is what they use on uh, like on computer screens. How often they kind of update this the kind of screen thing, and then uh, does mindfulness have a refresh rate? <laughs> Uh, where you return to sensation x times per second. Return to sensations. Do I experience like mindfulness as as? No, it, that doesn't make sense for me. That there is like this refresh rate. And to sensation x times per second. Uh, In one, the, okay, in one sense you can maybe say that, a little bit of what she said uh, a few minutes back about consciousness, and that consciousness is basically just a lot of consciousness going, coming after each other. It's not like just one permanent thing. It's just consciousness after consciousness after consciousness after consciousness after consciousness. So it's like, in that sense you can, you can call it like a refresh rate, mm -hmm. because it's not the same consciousness which perceives kind of uh, the next thing in your environment. It's, it's actually a new, new uh, consciousness. Uh, but we don't, we don't kind of, uh, we're not able to see that, uh, at least uh, uh, when we do our meditation practice in the beginning. Maybe when you get really, really deep in your meditation, you can start to look into this. And you get extremely deep in your meditation to try to understand the nature of consciousness and, and the mind. But for our practice and getting into deep meditation and joy and happiness and on, the, on a way up to <clears throat> uh, like deep meditation, it's not kind of, it, it, it's not like a helpful way of looking at it. It doesn't have like a function. But there are some truth to this, I must say, but that's an extremely deep level. So it lies really, really far ahead into your practice. And how many times a second? <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> really good questions, by the way. Challenging. At some point during the meditation, the heartbeat started to become apparent. How should one proceed from here? Go back to the breath? Uh, yes, this can happen because the mind's getting quiet and there's still some parts of the body that are moving. The heartbeat's quite um, coarse and it's quite regular, hopefully. Um, so the main thing there is uh, just to notice it, but not to uh, carry on watching it. You know, okay, let the heartbeat come, but you don't need to be worried about that. The heart's beating whether you're aware of it or not. So uh, just allow it to be there, but kind of just let it fall off your screen, so to speak. And uh, let the mind be where it wants to be. Um, yeah, we always used to hear in uh, Gurenkaji's teaching to go back to the breath. I find it a bit strange to keep going back to something or to kind of make too much of a struggle with something. For me, I generally try to notice the state of my mind and then recreate the conditions, if you like, for the breath to arise, which might just mean relaxing or just... Um, 
okay, so the heartbeat's there, and then just kind of recenter myself, just notice the mind again, how it's responding, how it's reacting, and then just invite the breath again, if you wish. I mean, it's a slight difference, but it's the same thing, really. So, yeah, just um, if it's easy for you to, to be with the breath, to continue being with the breath, then great. Um, if not, and if you're really distracted or if fear might come up, maybe sometimes fear comes up, especially if your heart's irregular, but don't worry, it won't be. Um, then you might want to do some loving kindness or something like that. But I think this is just a, a part of the process. So don't give it too much importance and just see if you can keep your mind quiet and passive and, uh, and calm. Yeah. This is not a question, but feeling very grateful for the teachings and the... Uh, Material conditions. A thousand thanks. This is Norwegian. Tusen tack. To Ramachanda, Anajanito, the organizer, Alan Sissel, uh, uh, the delicious food, lovely staff, and fellows. Very much meta to all. Greetings from retreatant. Well done. <laughs> Somebody is developing gratitude for the invitation. Excellent. And a question? Okay. What is spiritual bypassing? How is it different from letting go? We talked a little bit about that yesterday. Spiritual bypassing is like you have all this, <clears throat> like we have like kind of issues, like we, are, we have, we make, we, we make problems mentally, like we have hate, like we have us craving, we have fear, there's a lot of stuff in us which is uh, <clears throat> kind of, uh, which we can, uh, through wisdom, handle in a much, much better way, or better and better and better way. And spiritual bypassing is just basically just don't look at it and just maybe just meditate and just ignore it, and just stop there. Basically not working on the, uh, the roots of our problem and trying to solve them. That's my idea of spiritual bypassing. And uh, how is it different from letting go? The difference is, at least what I can say, letting go in Buddhism, is that it's something you do temporarily. Because, um, you know, it, <laughs> you know <laughs> the quest here? To kind of end hate, to end anger, to end fear, that's a big, big thing to try to do. It's really difficult, and it doesn't stop by just thinking about it. Because if that would be the case, then a lot of people have fixed that problem. So the reality is that we're going for a really, really big... Um, um, there's something really difficult we want to... Um, and kind of understand and solve. And to do that, we need to empower our mind, to make it, to enable it to dig into really, really deep, difficult uh, tendencies we have in, in us. And that's why we need to let go temporarily, come to a retreat, do our meditation, so you get this absolutely beautiful, fantastic um, uh, mind which has the guts and the clarity <laughs> to look at our mind and try to understand without just like, like not doing it. it it's, it's so, like, <clears throat> most people, they don't, for example, want to look at death. It's just no way that we are thinking about death or contemplating death. If there's so much resistance in us contemplating death, that we avoid it. But after uh, empowering our mind in deep meditation, we have like we have we don't have this fear, we don't have this craving, we don't have this um, negativity, and we are able to contemplate things we normally don't. So what we need is to kind of em to make our mind stronger, clearer. Uh, so that we can start to look at really difficult problems in our life. That's what we're doing. And that's what I call letting go. When we, we, teach, like, we teach like meditation, to let go, to let, to let go. And we do that temporarily. 
to lift the mind up as high as possible. And then we start to look at very difficult things and we try to solve really, really, really um, difficult elements we have in us as a living being. And that's the difference. Okay. My appetite has increased since my arrival, <laughs> which surprised me since I'm less active, have a less hectic day here, and I usually eat two meals a day. Here, after three meals, I'm still, I still think of food. Is this just me or my mind filling the stillness with food? <laughs> or learning meditation increases the appetite. Hmm. <laughs> I really don't know. Is it... Mm, it's not even that cold, is it, in here? So, I don't know. But is it really hunger? If it is hunger, then never mind. I mean, your body needs to do what it needs to do. If it's just that you're thinking about food, then it's probably a sign that your mind's looking for distractions because you've given up a lot of other kind of uh, pleasures. You've given up a lot of distractions, a lot of comforts. And generally, when we give one thing up, the mind just looks to repeat its old, same patterns with something else. So if you're used to craving for, I don't know, chocolate or company or <laughs> whatever it might be, um, now you can't have that, so you think about food. And that's just the way we're somehow addicted to sensuality, to sense pleasure. Um, but, I mean, one way to overcome that is not necessarily to try and uh, abstain as long as you're not making yourself feel really bad, really sick. But maybe just eat rather than with craving, but with a sense of gratitude in mind. You know, maybe recognizing that this food has been offered through the goodness and kindness and sacrifice of so many living beings. From the time it was planted, you know, to the time it was harvested and brought along to this place. They had to plow the path so many times with these big snowmobiles to get it here. <laughs> All these lovely people had to cook it for you. And you also had to work really, really hard to be able to afford to come here and to eat. So maybe with this kind of reflections, you can have more of a sense of, I don't know, in a way, I don't like to use this word, but kind of it's a sacred meal. It's sacred food. It's holy food, if you like because you're using it for the purpose of meditation. So uh, one of the little reflections we do as monastics is to remind ourselves before we eat uh, that we use this food not for beauty, fattening, pleasure or entertainment, but for the maintenance and nourishment of the body to overcome hunger, not to create new sensations of overeating, and basically to keep living blamelessly and at ease in order to realize the highest wisdom and happiness of this path. So if we can use the food that way, that's more important than how much you eat or what kind of food you eat. It's eating it for the right reasons with a beautiful attitude in mind. So see if you can do that. And uh, if you're still eating just as much, never mind. Be grateful to all the people that have offered the food. Yeah. Thank you. Thank just I, I, while she was talking, I, I remember uh, I, I like a simile for that. In my previous question about spiritual bypassing and letting go. <clears throat> that it's like you you want to build a house and you buy this property, and then build a house. You need to kind of dig in the ground, so which where you put the, the the foundation and all the 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 concrete. And in theory, you can go and pick up a <coughs> teaspoon. And then go out and try to and start digging because there's a lot, a lot of kind of dirt and sand, and you have to remove. And you can do that with a teaspoon. Mm -hmm. One step up is kind of picking up a spade. You can also do that absolutely manual. You can dig this big and remove a lot of dirt and sand with a spade. I don't know how long time it will take. Probably a lot of weeks, but it is possible. But you can also go and just get or hire an excavator, which is in Norwegian is a grav machine. And this excavator can do this in like two hours. It can remove all the dirt and all the sand so you can start building the, fund the, the foundations of the house. <coughs> and that is what we're doing in meditation. We're, we're kind of moving from working with a spoon, digging in the ground, until uh, all the way up to having an excavator which is, can go so deep, so quick, and so powerful. 
And that's this meditation, and that's this deep meditation. That's how it kind of empowers our mind to dig deep into our true nature. If a person belongs to a religion other than Buddhism, like Christianity or Islam, uh, agnosticism, does meditation work for him? Or her? Does it make sense to combine <coughs> meditation and another religion? So does, uh, so does a person belong to another religion other than Buddhism, does meditation work for them? Uh, yes. Um, um, yes, indeed. But I, the thing, like, if, if, you, if, you, if you come in with, like, a, a worldview from Christianity, then you are missing a lot of kind of theory and description of our, our nature. And I will say that you will not kind of find those, that level of wisdom without kind of knowing the, the teachings of the Buddha, like Buddhism. But meditation can be used indeed. It can be used the same as, same as like just finding peace and calm and happiness in your life. But uh, I would say that you don't get those stages of awakening. For that, you need another view of the world. And they don't exist in Christianity, as I see it today. And the same with Hinduism. Uh, so does it make sense to combine meditation and another religion? Yes, it makes sense. It's just that, that we can say that we say, Buddhism say that you can, uh, you can go further with the Buddhist theory. And I, and I, uh, I uh, uh, that's my opinion as well. So you can do that, and please do that. But I think you are setting a hindrance in front of you to get to uh, what the Buddha called for the absolute highest happiness, which he defined as a nirvana. Mm. Just to add to that, um, one thing that the Buddha said, I think this is in the suttas, I'm pretty sure. He basically said, wherever you find the Noble Eightfold Path, there you'll find enlightened beings. So you do need all eight factors of the Eightfold Path. And that includes samadhi, but it also includes right view. So the samadhi needs to be informed by right view to go deeper and to be able to break through the illusion of a self. Yeah. Thank you for a lovely yoga session. I didn't do it, but I'll take that. We are basically nine. Last question. Okay. Is it about putting meaning into life or finding meaning in life? <laughs> right, good question. Well, I suppose you could say whatever, whichever means the most to you. <laughs> what means the most, putting meaning in or finding meaning? I guess it's both. I know where this is coming from because Ajahn Brown once said meaning is the mean, meaning of life is the meaning you give to life, something like this. And I think with that, he's sort of saying that uh, we have the capacity to influence the direction our life will move in. We have some sort of choice, at least it appears that way. Um, certainly, if we've heard the teachings of the Buddha, that becomes more obvious to us because we, have, we understand that we can choose compassion over cruelty or judgment yeah we can choose loving kindness over ill will hatred anger we can choose uh giving letting go letting be generosity over acquiring sensuality over identification but we still have to train to do that <laughs> it's one thing to know that's a possibility and i think that's the first step but because of the habits of our mind, we are still going to fall into the opposites. Luckily, because of mindfulness and some teachings of the Buddha and some meditation, then we can see when we're doing that and we can make more and more of a conscious choice. And another really important thing in, uh, in the Buddha's understanding and therefore in our spiritual practice is the importance of being around wise people. Because if you're around people who act in those kind, compassionate ways, it will influence you. 
And that's very helpful because sometimes we find ourselves judging people who, you know, maybe deal drugs or get up to all sorts of uh, harmful behavior. But if they were raised around other people doing that or if they were born into poverty, if they didn't have good examples themselves, then, you know, how can you really judge? How can you really expect anything else? Whereas if, you know, we have uh, grown up around good role models, we're much, much more likely to have the choices evident to us and the conditioning to choose those, make those choices. Um, so it's really impersonal as to how we um, become conditioned. But yeah, once we have some wisdom and can see how our minds are working, there's this beautiful capacity, it's almost like a gift in being human, that we can see where we're suffering and we can see somehow how we create happiness inside just by, you know, looking at the workings of our mind. We can see if we have an unwholesome thought that it leads to tension, it leads to tightness, it leads to suffering. And we can almost naturally be inclined towards the happiness once we realise that. It's like the mind will turn away from it once we realise it's suffering. That's part of this nibida that we were talking about before that when you really see that something is suffering that it's not satisfying you don't have to condemn it you just naturally turn towards something that's more happy right so yeah in that way we put meaning into life finding meaning in life i think that just uh, slowly opens up but to me i mean there can be meaning in every moment there can be meaning in just being a kind person doing something compassionate for someone else has great meaning for ourselves and for others so, and that meaning will kind of maybe be more uh, specific for each one of us. But really, isn't the essence of everything kindness? You know, if you've lived a kind life, I mean, think about what you'd like to be remembered at, you know, for when you die. Would you like to be remembered as rich and successful and, you know, or would you like to be remembered as kind and compassionate, someone who gave of yourself for others? You really did something good in this world, so yeah. I guess that's enough. Thank you, everybody, and uh, have a wonderful night, if you wish. Ajahn Brahm always says, "If you wish," <laughs> <laughs> so as not to make any demands. Right.